All right, if you already turned to Hebrews, I'm going to send you somewhere else. So go to Psalm 119. Psalm 119. We just had a scripture reading from the section right before the section I want us to look at this morning. And so what we're going to do, actually, is we're going to have another responsive scripture reading. And so we'll read uh, verses 33 to 40. I'll read the odd-numbered verses, and then you read the even-numbered verses with me. Psalm 119, 33. Teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes, and I shall keep it to the end. Give me understanding, and I shall keep your law. Indeed, I shall observe it with my whole heart. Make me walk in the path of your commandments, for I delight in it. Incline my heart to your testimonies, and not to covetousness. Turn away my eyes from looking at worthless things, and revive me in your way. Establish your word to your servant, who is devoted to fearing you. Turn away my reproach, which I dread, for your judgments are good. Behold, I long for your precepts. Revive me in your righteousness. The old proverbial statement says, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Well, I'd say that's not true about dogs, <laughs> But it's certainly not true, and it shouldn't be true about people. Henry Ford got it right when he said, anyone who stops learning is old, whether 20 or 80. The ancient Greek philosopher Antisthenes said, the most useful piece of learning for the uses of life is to unlearn what is untrue can think of a setting where that would be very appropriate in our culture and society today, right? Sir Claus Moser said, education costs money, but then so does ignorance. <laughs> and someone said, an educational system isn't worth a great deal if it teaches young people how to make a living, but doesn't teach them how to make a life. I think there's only one thing, one thing in life that no one needs to be taught, and that is this. No one needs to be taught how to sin. No one needs to be taught to be selfish, which, of course, is sin. If you don't believe that, I would say, one, you're either grossly ignorant, or two, you don't have children. <laughs> How many of you trained your children to lie, cheat, or steal? Would you raise your hand if you taught your children to lie or cheat or steal? Okay, didn't think so. But yet, they know how to do those things, don't they? Their sin nature teaches them that. You and I don't need anyone to teach us to do wrong, but we definitely need someone to teach us to do right. Only God can teach you to live right, and what we read here is that he, he certainly wants to do so. And the psalmist cries out over and over again here, Lord, teach me. And I hope that, that those, two word, or those three words, Lord, teach me, will be on your mind throughout this and after we examine this passage of Scripture, that that would be a regular thought and prayer that we have that we would say, Lord, teach me. This is the message of the psalmist in Psalm 119, 33 to 40. It shows up in other places, but this is the emphasis of this particular stanza. Here the psalmist passionately prays that God and his word would be his teacher. In this stanza of the psalm, there is a petition in every verse, so there are nine requests in all. Over and over again, the writer pours out fervent prayers for participation, progress, 
and perseverance in God's school for right living and for instruction from his word. And that wasn't just for me to make that alliterated. <laughs> it's, it's really there. It just worked out that way. He is praying for participation, progress, and perseverance in right living and instruction from God's word. This morning, will you join the psalmist to be taught by God how to live, specifically how to live righteously? And so let's examine a prayer to be taught by God and his word. The psalmist pleads. He's really, if you, if you look further on, you can see that it, this really is a plead. This isn't just a casual thing, Lord, teach me. He's very serious about this, it's request. At some point we, we read in there that it, it's, it's almost like he, he needs this for life because he says, you know, I actually need to be revived to life. We'll see that when we get to the end. So he says, give me your divine teaching that I may know what you want me to know and do what you want me to do. And that I might do that then all the rest of my life, all the days of my life. Is that your desire? Is that your desire? Are you eager to be a student of the Word of God that you might do the Word of God and that it might produce in you righteous living? The human author of this psalm appears to be David. King David of Israel certainly had teachers. He had teachers. He was a king. He had prophets. He had wise men that were his advisors. And he had priests. Yet with all of that, he still begs for God to personally be his teacher. Let's look at the Psalms' ninefold petition and notice what he wants to be taught as expressed through this pleading prayer. You say, wow, Pastor Rob, you have nine points for this sermon. I, I, I do actually feel, in a sense, in a way, bad. The last two Sundays, I've been very long-winded. Please be patient with me. Forgive me for that. It, it's not my desire to be long-winded. I was. Some of my mentors said, if, if you... If you can do a worship service in about an hour and 15 minutes, it's a good amount of time, and then people will come back. <laughs> um, but I think, you, I think you felt my passion last week for the passage that we were in. There's nine things that the psalmist is asking for, but we can cover these fairly quickly, all right? And uh, the deacons installed a platform here. They can press a button if I go too long, I just fall down into the... So. <laughs> All right. Um, so let's look at these nine things. Number one, the psalmist prayed for spiritual instruction. He wanted instruction from God in his word. He is clearly devoted to the word of God. I mean, this is Psalm 119. This is the longest psalm and if we call this a chapter, it's a, it's a song, it's poetry, but if we call it a chapter, it's the longest chapter in the Bible. It has 176 verses. It is a psalm that exalts God's word. That's why we've been reading this, and we'll continue to read through it till we get to the end of verse 176. I just thought it'd be good for us to be reminded of the, the amazing word of God that we have and that we would be in it, and that we would be students of it. Of course, it exalts God. It uses eight terms to refer to Scripture. You'll be asked in the conferencing guide this week to come up with those terms. I'll give you some of them. He refers to Scripture as God's law, as his testimonies, as his precepts, as statutes, and judgments, to name a few. And then you'll be asked in the conference guide to try to figure out the slight differences of what those, what those mean. The psalmist is really enamored with the Word of God, and it dominated his thinking and his life. And the content of this psalm makes it obvious that he read God's Word. He studied 
God's word. He meditated on the word of God. He memorized the word of God. He delighted in it. He obeyed it. And he, he proclaimed it. Wouldn't that be wonderful if that were true as us, not only as individuals, but as a congregation, that Trinity Baptist Church would be known as people who read the Word of God. We study it. We meditate on it. We do memorize it. I hope you're memorizing with the church. But we, we delight in it. We love in it. We, we love it. We, we can't go without it. And that we're going to obey it, and then we're going to pass it on to others. We're actually going to proclaim it to others. And, and you'll see in verse 99 the effects of his, his uh, being immersed in the Word of God. If you look at verse 99, he says, I have more understanding than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. You know, if you will immerse yourself in the Word of God, you will have a tremendous amount of understanding. Understanding will mean that you'll know what the word means and you'll be able to apply it. It'll produce in you some discernment. But in, in spite of him saying, I have more understanding than all my teachers, he, he has this attitude and this plea and he wants to be taught more. What about you? Do you desire spiritual instruction like this? Do you recognize how much more spiritual instruction you need some of us have been saved for a long time we have we have been in church some three times a week some of you grew up in christian school and you had fathers that had devotional time with you we haven't some of us some of you are fairly new to uh christ and you haven't had as much exposure, but some of us have. And do we think we know it all? <laughs> or do we say, Lord, teach me more? And I need a better understanding of it. Um, we have so much more to learn. Are you personally immersing yourself in the Word of God? And, and are you taking advantage of the helps you're here for the worship service. Are you here for the morning Bible study hour that we call life group? Are you coming to the evening service when Pastor Tom breaks the word open and he has a message? And, and sometimes it's, it's like teaching and other times it's like preaching. It's, I know th those are really synonymous when you, when you understand the proclamation of the word of God. But it, there's an emphasis to teach something and then there's an emphasis to just Say, this is what the Word of God says. Now let's live it. We do that on Sunday night, midweek in a discipleship group. Uh, parents, do you have your children in expeditions and your teens in the youth group? These are crucial times of instruction that you and I need. And we shouldn't miss those times. I know I encourage you that with that often. But really, that's we have one day a week. And uh, in a midweek, and so let's take advantage if we, if we want to be immersed in the Word of God. Someone uh, had said that education is the process of going from unconscious ignorance to conscious ignorance. Think about that statement. I mean, man, when I, when I had one semester of college, my freshman year, I came home, man, did I know a lot. And, and, and my parents, my dad had a high school education, and then he had some, some evening uh, school to learn some algebra, and, and he worked at a, a machine shop in the University of Chicago in the physics department. And uh, so I had more education than dad. And so I, I must have known more until I matured and realized after I graduated from college, dad has been much further down the road of life than me. He actually knows more than I do. I should probably listen to him. Teens, are you listening to what I just said? Um, conscious ignorance. All of us should recognize our spiritual ignorance and cry out to God like this psalmist says and say, Lord, teach me. David prayed for spiritual instruction. Number two he prayed to learn more from the master teacher. How about this statement? 
Someone once said, he who is his own pupil has a fool for his teacher. That's good. Only God can truly teach us how to live. You alone cannot teach yourself how to live right. Other people alone cannot teach you how to live right. They can help, especially if their source is the right source. Right, Brother Jim? They have the right source. Certainly, 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 the world that you live in will not and cannot teach you to live right. That's why we have a Christian school, by the way. The master teacher, our God and Savior, can teach you, but you must submit to the master teacher to learn to live, the psalmist says, righteously. Christian, are you submitting to him in obedience to his word? Are you faithful to him? And do you seek his guidance day by day? So David wanted to learn from the master teacher. And number three, he prayed to learn the master subject. The psalmist desired the way of God's statutes. He wanted to learn the spiritual way to live life. He, he wanted to live biblically. He wanted to find the answers to life. They would come from the Word of God. He saw it as God's instructions manual for life. He recognized God's truth as absolute truth and trusted completely in it, and he applied it to all of life. Number four, he, he prayed for spiritual insight. Look at verse 34. He's asking for understanding. How important is it for us to have Bible knowledge? It is important, right? But how good is that knowledge without understanding and insight and spiritual wisdom? I mean, know the Bible. Know what's in there. But hopefully it'll do more for you other than if you end up on Jeopardy that you win because you actually know the, the, the Old Testament or New Testament Bible questions that are put in there. <laughs> I, know that, I know that's silly. I'm trying to make a point. What do you do with your knowledge of God's Word? Well, I know it. Well, that's good. But do you, do you know it for understanding and insight and spiritual wisdom? What is wisdom? It is the ability to, do, to use knowledge in the right way. Spiritual wisdom, Bible wisdom, is to say, I know truth about the Bible, I understand it, and I can use it in the right way. The writer didn't just want to have a head knowledge. He wanted it to impact his heart and his manner of life. He wanted it to impact his affections, wanted it to direct his life. And so I ask you this morning, has your knowledge of God and his word had an impact on your heart, your will, and your emotions, and it, has it caused you to devote your life to God, his word, and his ways? Folks, I, I'm more and more concerned about church people, Christians, that have a knowledge of God's word, but they have no spiritual discernment. No true wisdom. It's not helping them to make godly decisions and choices, but boy, they know it. I got my Bible studies, but are you able to understand it and apply it to real life situations? That's what David is asking for. Is your knowledge of God and his word leading you to a righteous life? That should be the impact of the word of God. It leads you to a righteous life. And that righteous life is one that honors and obeys and glorifies God. If you have more than knowledge, if you actually have understanding, then you will affectionately love God and his word. You will obey him and you will live by his word. My thoughts go to Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Probably many of you have that me memorized, right? Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge Him and He shall direct your paths. Your knowledge of Him and His word will make your way straight. That's what that's saying. Number five, he prayed for spiritual feet, for guidance. 
Verse 35, make me walk in the path of your commandments, for I delight in it. The psalmist wanted God to guide him in the path of his commandments. He wanted to walk in God's ways. He wanted to go and do what God wanted him to do. This guidance is important because we are prone to wander away from God, aren't we? We are prone to wander. You, you know the, the old hymn, the hymn writer expressed, Oh, to grace, how great a debtor daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander. Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart. Oh, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. If we are not guided by God's word, we will wander. Pray for guidance and you will find it as you're in the word of God and you're led by the word of God. Number six, he prayed for a spiritual heart. Look at verse 36. He says, incline my heart to your testimonies and not to covetousness. The word incline there means to be bent toward. Our hearts will either be bent toward toward God's toward God and toward his word or toward our own selfish ways. We live in such a self-centered and me-oriented society. Do you agree with me? We can so easily have selfish hearts because we're in this culture. You do realize the culture affects even Christians. <laughs> right? Um it's a self-centered, it's a me-oriented society. It's very easy for us to have selfish hearts. We had uh, Friday here, we had a kindergarten graduation, and we had our uh, high school graduation. And um, the kindergarten graduation was first. Uh, it was one graduation. But we, we had the kindergartners up here, and they sang the song that Miss Carrie taught them throughout the year with energy and enthusiasm. It was a blessing to hear those little children sing. And you could tell that they had a heart to sing it. Isn't that wonderful? And, and then they got their diplomas. Our kindergarten teacher passed out the diplomas. And then you know what happened? Kindergarten parents took their kids and left. Some of them. Not all of them. Um, look, there's a reason we put the kindergarten graduation with the high school graduation. And one of the things we want the kindergarten parents to see is that there's an end result. It's not actually an end, but there, there's a purpose in what we do. And we had, we had one graduate, graduate from Trinity this year, and I would say she's, she's one of our best since I've been here. Leah is one of our best. She, she really is, I, I don't want to... I hate to put it this way, but I'm trying to find a way to, to say it. She really is a product of Trinity Baptist School, her parents, and her church. Now, we're not, it's not a cookie-cutter thing that, okay, Alex, he's a product. <laughs> but what he is, he's a, he, he and other graduates, I just saw another Trinity grad sitting here, that's why I singled him out. But he, he is one that the Lord used the instruction of his parents, his church, and his Christian school to develop him in his character and his love for God. And so it would have been good for those kindergarten parents to see, oh, look at that graduate, and to hear the testimony that she gave. It was a valedictorian address that had a spiritual challenge to it. That's what our graduates do. They're not all perfect, but... It just, I was so disappointed. So you're so selfish that you're, I gave a challenge. It wasn't because it was me. It could have been any other person. We give the graduate and the audience a challenge from the word of God. They left. They didn't stay for that. It's a negative example, but maybe that helps us to understand. We should desire to hear the word of God. And so the psalmist asks God for a spiritual heart, and he immerses, immerses himself into the Word of God. Who has your heart? Do you have a spiritual heart? Do you have a heart for God? If you do, you'll have a heart for His Word. Number seven, 
he prayed for spiritual eyes. Verse 37, turn away my eyes from looking at worthless things. It should be our prayer and our practice to have our focus on God. But too often our focus is on vain things and empty things or worse yet sinful and wicked things which will lead us astray from what is spiritual and right and true. And that was part of the message last week. We need to get our gaze off of the worthless, empty, temporal things of this world and put our eyes and focus on the spiritual and eternal things of God and His kingdom. We certainly need to get our eyes off of the sinful things. Take our focus off of our idols and worldly pleasures and put our focus on our great and glorious God. Earlier in verse 18, the psalmist says, Open my eyes that I may see wondrous things from your law. Folks, there's wondrous things in here. May we see it. May we live it. We need to understand the organic connection between our eyes and our soul. Think about that statement. The organic connection between our eyes and our soul. What we see is what we become, and what we look at is what we desire to have or to be. And what we look at affects how we live. And so the psalmist is asking God to keep his eyes from paying undue attention on worthless and meaningless things. And I'm going to challenge the parents again here. Parents, do you know the direction of the gaze of your children? You better, you better know that. Are your children like Lot of old who gazed on the plains of Jordan and gazed on the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and got enamored with the pleasures of those places and the pleasures that they could offer them? Let us not, let us not forget where that look took Lot. Let us not forget the hardship that it brought. As the old hymn says, turn your eyes upon who? Jesus. Look full in his what? His wonderful face. And then the things of this earth will grow strangely dim and the light of his glory and grace. Number eight, he prayed for a proper fear. Verse 38 says, establish your word to your servant who is devoted to fearing you. This is the fear of God. This has a particular meaning to it. The psalmist was devoted to the fear of God, meaning he had a reverence for God and a trust in God. That is clear. He depended on God with a confidence in God. The psalmist was indicating that he trusts that God will do what he promises. God's word of promise belongs to those that fear him. In verse 39, he says, Turn away my reproach, which I dread, for your judgments are good. The reproach that is mentioned there, I believe, is referring to his own behavior. In other words, he's saying, I don't want to do anything in my behavior, in my conduct, that will give the enemies of the Lord an opportunity to blaspheme. He didn't want to harm the name of God and the testimony of God. And so he prays this. Let us not harm the testimony and name of our God. Let us fear God more than we fear man. Reverence him. Trust him. Live a godly life regardless of how it may impact you. Live righteously regardless of how the enemies of God may react to your godly pursuits and godly stand. And don't allow anything in your life that would give the ungodly an opportunity to scoff at him. Avoid harming your, harming your testimony before him. Avoid hypocrisy as it harms your credibility as a representative of God. Be salt and light before the lost and sinful world. And glorify God in how you act and how you live before others. Our testimony is important. And then number nine, he prayed for revival. Verse 40 says, Behold, I long for your precepts. Revive me in your righteousness. He testified that he longs for God's word. 
He earnestly desired God's teaching so that it would lead him to righteousness. It is as though he is presenting himself as a dying man who needs revival. He needs to be revived, and so he asks God to quicken him, to renew life in him. He's asking God to give him a righteous life. Believer, do you long for God's word to give you a more righteous life? Do you have a deep longing in God's truth to produce righteousness in you? And do you desire the word to help you to grow in godliness? May the psalmist's prayer be our prayer. May we cry out, Lord, teach me. And if you pray that, where should you be? It should be right here. Teach me. Let us pray for spiritual instruction from the master teacher in the master subject to gain spiritual insight, for spiritual guidance, to have spiritual hearts and eyes that God would revive us to live a more righteous life. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. And like your servant David, may we cry out to you, Lord, teach us. May we be in your word. May we take advantage of every opportunity to know it more, to understand it better, to live by it, to, to apply it to our lives. Lord, use your word to give us spiritual wisdom and discernment in life. And Father, may we know it so that we can proclaim it to others. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.